Okay, let's look at lecture two, microbiology. Now the aim of this unit is to provide a detailed understanding of microorganisms, their effect on the food industry, and how they can be effectively controlled. And the learning outcomes, by the end of this module, you will be able to determine the requirements of bacteria, understand the temperatures involved in the growth and death of bacteria, identify specific bacteria, define toxins and spores, and state which substances will stop the growth of bacteria. So let's have a look at bacteria, the size, shape and structure. First of all, bacteria are living organisms, uh, they're animals, uh, they're microscopic, so you can't see them with the human eye, uh, you can only see them with a microscope. You can see colonies of bacteria, um, a million salmonella, for example, would be about the size of a pinhead. They're found everywhere, so they're ubiquitous. They're mostly harmless, so it's only the minority, really, are what we call pathogens. Now, remember the word pathogen comes from the Greek word pathos, meaning illness. So a pathogen causes illness. Obviously, we know that food poison can kill, but the actual definition for pathogen is causes illness. Now, I say mostly harmless. Um, the, the studies have shown that we're probably talking about 0.001% of all bacteria are pathogens or will cause harm. Now, they're, they're mostly pathogens because uh, they start off as harmless bacteria. In other words, they're good for the environment, good for us. Uh, they mutate into pathogens, which then uh, will cause us harm. As I meant there, a few cause illness, very small percentage. Some are essential. Uh, in fact, from a biotechnology point of view, uh, we need them in the soil to break down any dead and decaying vegetation and animals, etc. Um, we use them in composting. Uh, we use them as um, E. coli, for example, is used as the source for non-human insulin which we use for um, injecting into people with uh, type 1 diabetes, for example. Um, other ones, uh, we use bacteria to uh, dissolve oil spillages at sea. Um, there are a lot of uses of bacteria in the environment. Um, as I say, some are essential. Some cause spoilage. Uh, we look at spoilage bacteria later on. Now the shapes of bacteria, they vary. We've got the cocci, or cocci, uh, these are round globular type bacteria. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus, for example. This is uh, the bacteria that inhabit our skin. Um, and the slide uh, behind, the design behind, this is actually uh, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, looking under a microscope. So I've used this under a lot of slides. Um, and it, it, it does actually look like a bunch of grapes. And Staphylococcus, uh, again, is Greek for a bunch of grapes. So these are the cocci. So Staphylococcus aureus, for example. We've got rods. E. coli is an example of a rod shaped. Now you will uh, go on to other shapes. You've got spirochytes and lastly, vibrios. And what I always remember is Vibrio parahelitticus. So, let's have a look at a bacterial cell. So this is showing a rod-shaped cell. Let's have a look at the various components. First of all, we've got the nuclear material. This is the DNA. Uh, scientists have found that DNA, especially in, co in E. coli, which is studied quite substantially, is very similar to the DNA in human beings and other animals, and as plants as well. Um, so therefore, possibly showing the uh, evolutionary... Uh, similarities, if you like, between uh, bacteria, humans, and uh, vegetation. So this is the, if you like, the bacteria's identity. The same with our identity, it's the DNA. We've got the cytoplasm. This is the uh, liquid uh, part of the bacterial cell. Uh, this is where all the uh, action goes on. This is where all the 
um, food is taken into and dissolved and used up as nutrients and expelled accordingly as waste material. The cell membrane, uh, this is very particular in, in as much as what it will allow over the cell membrane and what it um, will export through the cell membrane. It's a semi-permeable membrane. The cell wall, uh, very rigid cell wall, uh, which again protects the uh, bacterial cell from destruction. Uh, stops any liquids sort of um, seeping out and uh, desiccating the inside or in fact all of the bacterial cell. And the capsule or the slime layer, uh, this actually gives it uh, motivational uh, properties. In other words, it can move through uh, and on substances because of the slime layer. The flagella gives it uh, motivation. Uh, if you've ever seen this in, or, um, in, in, a, in a slide, in a video, you will see it actually, it's like, um, it's like a person swimming, doing the breaststroke. And these two flagella, if you like, are like arms that flap back and forth to project the bacterial cell forward, backward, or whichever way it wants to. And the fimbriae, these are uh, used for adhesive uh, properties. Uh, these cause this cell to stick to um, animals, animals' guts, uh, onto other cells. So these, uh, as I say, this gives it uh, adhesive qualities. And what are the requirements for bacterial multiplication? Well, we need nutrients. Uh, first of all, moisture content. Um, AW, which is uh, the moisture content, needs to be between 0.99 and 0.95. Anything lower than that, then it's too dry for the bacteria to survive. Warmth. Now, you've got different uh, types of bacteria. You've got psychrophiles, which prefer temperatures less than 20 degrees C. We've got mesophiles, or mesophiles. They prefer 20 to 50 degrees C. And thermophiles are uh, greater than 45 degrees C. Pathogens, food safety pathogens, fall under mesophiles, which is 20 to 50 degrees C. Um, some psychrophiles, for example, can go down to uh, 0 degrees C. Uh, some thermophiles can go up to 116 degrees C. Uh, these are the ones that live uh, under sea near thermal vents. Uh, time, oxygen. Uh, we need a pH, that's the alkalinity acidity value, greater than 4.5. Now, the, and I'll go through this later, the, the scale of pH is from 0 to 14. 7 is pH neutral. So really, most mesophiles, most pathogens prefer about pH 7. Uh, again, the same as human beings and other animals. The absence of competition. Uh, pathogens are not very competitive. In fact, pathogens, which are different from spoilage bacteria, if spoilage bacteria are present, then you will find that uh, there won't be any pathogens uh, there either. Going back to oxygen, um, I think, uh, well, I will mention this later on, but oxygen, the bacteria can survive with small amounts of oxygen medium amounts of oxygen and high amounts of oxygen. And the absence of preservatives. Uh, any preservatives present obviously will stunt the growth or prevent the growth of bacteria. So let's have a look at the different food types. Now first of all, high risk foods have uh, got a water content between 0.95 and 0.99, so they're ideal for bacteria growth. And bacteria love high risk foods. If they can get access to high-risk foods and they're left in a warm environment, uh, they will multiply quite quickly. In fact, they can double in size uh, from 1 to 6 billion within about 6 hours left in the right conditions. Because that's how bacteria grow. They grow by multiplication. So high-risk foods include things like usually foods you find in a refrigerator that need to be kept cold and are already cooked, and they've got a high protein content. So we've got some examples there of pâtés, so-called cheeses, 
uh, seafoods, uh, you've got prawns, you've got mussels already been cooked, some pork pies, quiches, uh, sandwiches, the ham sandwich perhaps, you've got a sausage roll, again all these items usually are cold. They're common food vehicles in food poisoning, usually protein ready to eat, stored in the refrigeration and there's no further processing or reheating required. Now raw foods, uh, there we've got vegetables, meat and fish. These are a major source of food poisoning organisms. So in other words, this is where we'll find them in raw foods. And if the raw foods come into contact with high risk foods, then we've got a big problem. That's called cross contamination. So if the raw foods come into contact with the high risk foods, either directly by touching it or indirectly, where there's a fomite or something like a, a cloth or a hand uh, touching the raw food and touching the high-risk food, you'll get cross-contamination. If the high-risk food is left in warm conditions, the bacteria will start to grow. The person will eat that food, they will get food poisoning. Other ones, low-risk foods. Uh, we call low-risk because they will not support the growth of pathogens or other bacteria. Normally, uh, they're acid food, or they could really vary. Different types of foods have different uh, properties. They could be acid foods, uh, such as pickles, chutney sauces, where they've got a pH of less than 4.5, so it's quite acidic. Where it's got a high sugar, salt, or fat content, obviously these are good natural preservatives. Dry products, where there's a low availability of water, that's what the AW stands for. It includes preserved foods not requiring refrigeration and anything held in ambient storage, uh, that's room temperature. Then ready to eat raw foods. Ready to eat raw foods such as fruit and salad vegetables should be thoroughly washed before consumption to minimise the risk from low dose pathogens. Now low dose pathogens, which we'll find out later on, are, or will cause a foodborne disease rather than food poisoning. Now, there are two different types of diseases. Food poisoning usually requires a high number of bacteria to cause food poisoning. With foodborne diseases, they usually require just from one to several bacteria in order to cause a foodborne disease. So, let's have a look at temperatures uh, what sort of temperatures the bacteria require so what i've got here is a, a thermometer or a germometer and it, sh it will show you what happens to bacteria at certain temperatures so this thermometer goes from minus 18 degrees c up to and above 70 degrees c so everything is in celsius obviously if uh, you need to work this out in fahrenheit um, you need to Use the formula, I believe, is something like uh, multiplying by 9 over 5 and adding 32. And the reverse if one go from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So let's have a look. At 18 degrees C, bacteria are in hibernation. They won't grow. You won't kill them by freezing them. They'll just remain dormant. And minus 18 or lower is the temperature that our freezers should be at. Then you've got 1 to 4 degrees C. Uh, this is our fridge temperatures. Uh, ideally, if you can keep fridges uh, below 3 degrees C, but without freezing any of the salad items, that would be great. Because uh, food safety bacteria, apart from listeria, won't grow below 3 degrees C. So at this temperature, the bacteria are still sleepy. Uh, they're waking up, but it's still a bit too cold for them to multiply or to grow uh, to any substantial size. Then we go from 5 degrees C to 63 degrees C. This is called the temperature danger zone. You must keep bacteria or food that might contain bacteria out of the temperature danger zone. So in other words we either keep it cold in this zone here or keep the food hot in this zone here. If we go into the temperature danger zone, this is where bacteria will multiply. They'll start to grow slowly at 5 degrees C, very, very slowly. 
and they will increase in number the warmer it gets. As it gets warmer, they wake up, they start to multiply more readily. The ideal temperature for multiplication is 37 degrees C, which is body temperature. Anything higher than 37 degrees C, then they will start to slow down. Um, they won't multiply any further. Around about 55, 56, all bacteria are killed. But we go up to 63 as the top of the temperature danger zone, although by then all bacteria are killed anyway. 63 is classed as a disinfection temperature. Uh, it's also classed as the temperature at which, if you're keeping food hot, it must be kept at 63 degrees or above. The cooking temperature we tend to go for is 75 degrees C. Uh, these, or this comes from recommendations from Environmental Health Departments and the Food Standards Agency, although from a quality point of view it does nothing to the food. Um, it's probably best to cook your food, uh, whether it's chicken, meat, um, or any other products, to round about between 60 and 63 degrees C. This is where you get minimum shrinkage, you get moist products, and it's going to be safe because all the bacteria are killed anyway. But if questions do come up uh, in the exam from a food safety point of view, it's 75 degrees C that we need to attain. And boiling water is 100 degrees C. There are no bacteria surviving at that temperature. So let's have a look at the bacterial growth curve. Um, a lag phase, well, we've got several phases, lag phase, log phase, stationary phase, and a decline phase. Uh, the lag phase, really, there's no multiplication. Uh, the temperature there is uh, perhaps the ideal temperature, but the bacteria are still uh, using up uh, nutrients um, and enzymes uh, in order to get a large enough number so they can multiply quickly, which they will do, which is called the log phase. This is where they're multiplying, um, they're doubling in size between every 10 minutes or between 10 and 20 minutes. Now, the stationary phase really is where they don't grow any further. This is because they might have run out of nutrients, um, the temperature might be okay, other conditions might be okay, but there might be a reason for them not growing any further, or there might be so many that the competition is, is too high. And after the stationary phase, there's what we call the decline phase, uh, is where they start to reduce in number. So there's no multiplication in the lag phase, there's rapid multiplication in the log phase. The numbers of bacteria remain constant as the number produced is equal to the number dying. And the numbers of bacteria decrease in the decline phase. So let's have a look at the oxygen requirements of bacteria. We've got different types of bacteria. We've got anaerobic bacteria. These are bacteria that will happily survive without oxygen. Um, and so you'll see them in liquid, for example, uh, where they'll survive because there is no oxygen. All the oxygen is on the uh, surface of the food. Obligate aerobes you will find on the surface of food. Obligate must, means that they must have oxygen in order to survive. Facultative anaerobes um, can live with or without oxygen. And obligate anaerobes means they must not have any oxygen. Um, the bacteria that, that uh, springs to mind there are the Clostridia, or Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium botulinum. They are obligate anaerobes. So let's have a look at uh, water activity limits for microbial growth. So we're going from 1 to 0.6, where 1 is uh, full water, if you like, and 0.6 is dry. And it shows the different types of bacteria uh, and the, the types of water they require in order to survive and grow. Pseudomonas, uh, they need a lot of water. 
to 0.95 and about 0.98 E. coli and clostridium or clostridia there's two there around about 0.5 to 0.3 salmonella we got bacillus staph aureus staphylococcus aureus mosis mos mos xerophilic osmophilic uh, xerophilic and osmophilic yeasts um, require very small amounts of water indeed so you see on the bottom that Arjun says AW is distilled water and um, 0.0 all water molecules are completely bound but you will find even dried products uh, such as dried rice or powders uh, do have a water content albeit very small not enough for any bacteria to grow so I mentioned earlier about the pH scale uh, goes from 1 to 14 uh, where 1 is acid, 7 is neutral, and 14 is alkaline. Bacteria prefer uh, neutral conditions, uh, although E. coli have been known to grow in acidic conditions, uh, around about 4.55. So we got uh, low acid food uh, is classed as 4.5. Um, where acid it would be one alkaline we tend to get yeah, cleaner materials tend to have alkalinity around about the top 14 value how do we destroy bacteria well we can do it through pasteurization uh, that's the temperature that i mentioned about 63 degrees seen above this destroys pathogens uh, sterilization is uh, a temperature that's really difficult to achieve in a normal kitchen because it's 121 degrees C, or in excess of that, uh, for a period of time. But if we achieve that temperature, it destroys all bacteria, spores, and toxins. That sort of temperature you'll see, uh, or, or you'll see of use in autoclaves and uh, heat under pressure. Now, canning uh, is classed as commercially sterile. Canning actually use the sterilization process, where it's heated for 121 degrees C and above. Uh, for a period of time and effective cooking uh, will kill bacteria I've already mentioned that bacteria start dying around about 55 to 56 degrees C um, but anything up to 75 degrees C and you can be assured that it's very safe to eat but I've already mentioned anything from I've experimented myself with temperatures from 57 up to 63 um, it's safe. Uh, if you use the sous vide process, for example, uh, this is where you vacuum pack foods and cook them for an extended period of time at lower temperatures such as 60 degrees C. Uh, in effect, the 60 degrees C will penetrate all the food, killing all pathogens, but it doesn't coagulate the proteins as much as overcooking to a temperature 75 degrees C does. Uh, we can use chemicals to kill bacteria. Salt, sugar, nitrates, nitrites, for example. Um, what salt and sugar tend to do is draws moisture out of foods, so it makes it less desirable for pathogens to grow. And nitrates and nitrites actually act as preservatives, chemical preservatives, so the bacteria won't grow. Um, irradiation is a process uh, which is used throughout uh, several continents. But only spices are licensed for irradiation in the UK. Uh, ultraviolet light is used in uh, quite a few industries, especially in the shellfish uh, industry. It destroys bacteria in water, destroys bacteria in brine, and it destroys microorganisms in the atmosphere. You might have seen, uh, as an example, um, I think it's the, oh, the new hand dryers, uh, you find, um, I'm trying to think of the name of them now, uh, Dysons, I think they are. Um, but uh, other ones are available, of course, uh, for advertising purposes. Um, but when you press the start button, there's um, a bright blue light, if you like. That is ultraviolet light that's actually helping destroy any pathogens uh, that might be on hands after you wash them. So you're drying them, but the ultraviolet light helps to uh, give it a double whammy, if you like. And spores. Now, only two families of bacteria produce spores, and they are clostridium, 
and Basilas Orchestridia bacilli. Uh, these are the only two pathogens that produce spores. So what are spores? It's called the resistant resting phase of these two bacterial families. Where most bacteria are killed through heat, through radiation, through chemicals or disinfection, Clostridial, Clostridium bacillus uh, will not die. They'll turn into spores. Uh, but more precisely, uh, the spore is really already present inside of the bacterial cell. And so what happens under unfavorable conditions, the bacterial cell dies off and the spore comes into being. Now spores can survive high temperatures. Uh, for example, up to 2,500 degrees C, a rocket taking off, and minus uh, 200 degrees C from liquid nitrogen. They can survive chemicals such as disinfectants. They can survive dehydration. So under unsuitable conditions, with a bacterial cell, a spore forms in the cell. As I already mentioned, it's already in the cell, but it starts to develop in earnest. Uh, when the uh, conditions become unsuitable. The cell disintegrates, releasing the spore. Under suitable condition, uh, suitable conditions rather, the spore germinates, turns back into a bacterial cell. And then the cell will multiply. So a bacterial spore, now bacterial spores are, uh, for all intents and purposes, harmless. We ingest spores on a daily basis from the atmosphere. Uh, they go down through our digestive system. Uh, our, ass, uh, sorry, our stomach is very acidic, so it stops the spores from germinating. Uh, but if they do germinate and they start to grow, that's when we get a problem. So spores per se do not cause food poisoning, but the bacterial cells that germinate from them do. Uh, it's a bit of a cyclical process. The, the bacterial cells turn into spores, spores turn back into cells, etc., etc. And toxins are organic poisons produced by uh, animals, plants, and bacteria. Uh, the first one is called, with bacterial cells, an exotoxin. Uh, these are toxins, poisons, which are produced when the cell multiplies or grows in food. So Staphylococcus aureus, for example, if we cough or sneeze uh, over food, we release Staphylococcus aureus because we are the uh, depository, suppository, if you like, for uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, they're on our skin, they're in our nose, our mouth. So if we release those bacteria onto food, and it's high-risk food, and the food is at, uh, at, at warm temperatures, they will start to grow. As the bacteria grow, they give off waste products called exotoxins. Waste material. Like when we grow, for example, we give off uh, feces and urine. Uh, they are poisons to other um, animals. These are poisons to us and exotoxins from Staph aureus. <coughs> Excuse me. Another one is endotoxin. Endo meaning within. Uh, again, a Greek word uh, from within. This is when the bacteria already in the uh, colon or the small intestine and they start to die. And as they die, the toxins are released from the cell walls. So you can see the, the cell starting to dissolve in this diagram here and releasing the toxins, uh, or the LDS as we call them, uh, into the system, the body system. And these toxins will affect uh, our immune system in as much as our immune system will sell, uh, send um, its uh, immune cells to the point where the toxins are and it will start to absorb the toxins. But um, this is not an easy process. There is a lot of uh, pain and discomfort involved in our immune system actually tackling uh, the uh, toxin cleanup, if you like. This is where we start to get uh, pains like abdominal cramps, etc. Now, how do we identify bacteria? Uh, well, we can use a macroscopic examination. 
Um, this is large scale examination, if you like, uh, by seeing them growing in colonies uh, on agar agar on petri dishes. Microscopic examination, obviously using a microscope. Uh, using something called the gram stain. Uh, this is, uh, we can tell if it's uh, gram negative or gram positive. And Graham's uh, uh, a scientist that invented this uh, process where um, you use a certain stain uh, for bacteria. Certain bacteria will hold on to the stain and other ones will um, not hold on to the stain. So you can tell by the different colours. Uh, biochemical reactions, obviously bacteria will react to certain chemicals um, given certain gases off or different reactions. Uh, serological typing, um, again using, for example, salmonella has got about 2,500 different types of strains. So using this we can find out which type of strain it is. Uh, phage typing, again similar to serological typing and using things called immunoassay. Um, for more details on the uh, gram stain, the reactions, type in and the MUSA. If you look at the notes that are being provided, it'll give you some further info. So the key points for lecture two, food poison bacteria are common in all food businesses. They require food moisture time, suitable pH to multiply. Most pathogenic bacteria prefer 20 to 50 degrees C, and they call mesophiles or mesophiles. <coughs> Excuse me, they can double number in 10 minutes. Temperatures above 75 degrees C are used to destroy them. Some toxins and spores can survive boiling for several hours. Most food poison bacteria do not grow below 5 degrees C. High acids, salt and sugar stop multiplica multiplication of bacteria. And there are various methods of identification of specific bacteria.